<laughs> yes. We can't hear you. We cannot hear you. What happened? And that is it, the Bumika's participation, <laughs> dear audience. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. -uh. Oh. I like the hair yeah. though. <laughs> yeah, new haircut. Yeah. When is the last time I met Bumika? Yeah, I think it was 2019, the last, last time. Now it's same like, here. it's not like, it's same you, you too, Amelia? Yeah. <laughs> like live. I, <laughs> I think all of us met each other in person in 2019. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I met Bumika. No, no, no. <laughs> The first time I met Bumika, I think it must have been in 2014 or even 13, maybe. Uh, Bumika has uh, a long track on working at the in the hallways of the UN and uh, a huge expertise in really um, monitoring the, the hardcore processes. So, yeah, even though if you never met Bumika in person, she's a legend in the UN hallways. So. Yes, you're coming in. We can, hear you. We can yes, hear you. You can hear me. Yes, yes. I have to go yes. into audio. Basically, it's um. Oh, this always gets me. It's the internal microphone, not the default microphone. How am I supposed to know the difference? It all sounds the same, right? Default microphone, <laughs> internal microphone. <laughs> I mean, that, that could be a topic for another conversation, but we're live now. And uh, say hello to the audience. <laughs> but great, it's coming in now. Yes, we can hear you. It's lovely to see you, Amelia. Yeah. You know, say no to WTO. Oh, yeah. And Tepet, how are you in Philippines? <laughs> Well, I'm feeling much better now, Very now good. that I'm with all of you. So we're going to be a powerhouse for uh, tonight's show. Yeah. Mumika, tell us who, who you are, where you're based at, what do you do? Just introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so I am right now in Brooklyn and since uh, 2009, essentially, I've been at Third World Network. Uh, I lead Third World Network's uh, global economic justice, global economic governance work. Um, essentially, the international financial architecture, which is a wonky policy nerd term <laughs> for the systems and structures that maintain and perpetuate economic imperialism today. So essentially, I, I, I do see uh, us at Third World Network and all of my comrades, all of my feminist sisters as anti-imperialists. We, we are today's anti-imperialists. Nowhere yes. as Che Guevara and Thomas Sankara, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we are today's anti-imperialists in every sense uh, of the way. It just uh, sometimes doesn't look as dangerous and sexy as being in the forest with arms and a gorilla cover and it, you know, nowhere as existentially threatened, but I do think of us as anti-imperialist um, resistors. <laughs> totally. Yes, thank you for that. And you know, last last episode, we had Sanam Amin as our guest, and she no. was talking about about how this this world needs decolonial solutions and but rather we laid the stage to understand why we're still talking about colonialism nowadays why it's not something mm -hmm. out of the past how it's very current uh and then we touched upon many things even uh military economies and stuff like that but we really wanted to ask you to help us think uh with the audience about what could be a decolonial future you know and uh, i was explaining the audience that you have a very strong position on not saying oh this is a dream that may happen or not that may fade or not that we need to think about futures like be hopeful i keep on building that way so so tell us a bit more about that why why and how do you foresee a decolonial future 
Absolutely. This is, I think, the number one thing I am obsessed with that I'm deeply passionate with. And I think this is really the only way forward. Um, the, way, the way that I would see a decolonial future is premised on three areas. And it's, in fact, um, a combination of the decolonial theoretical framework, as well as the um, 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 arguments and uh, analysis that has come from the abolitionist movement and from critical race theory and from uh, feminist theory. So uh, sort of structured around three key areas, right? The first key area being really looking at the ways in which colonialism created social hierarchies, right? Race is a colonial creation. It was literally a rationale for in the, for for slavery in the transatlantic route it was a rationale created to facilitate the transfer of human labor from the african continent to the americas patriarchy one of the oldest constructions uh predating anglo-saxon colonialism but certainly a uh creation of social hierarchy it is not in any way, it, it is not in any way biophysiological. So really the dismantling of social hierarchies, the dismantling of social hierarchies on the grounds of race, on the grounds of gender, on the grounds of caste, on the grounds of sexual orientation, on the grounds of ability. And today also gender includes, you know, the what the amazing generation z is doing around non-conforming gender identities and the fluidity of gender identities going back to really the original way in which gender was a fluid expression one that could shift through life one that was you know really uh, uh, um, an expression of one's sovereign autonomy and the second framework is really looking at the production of knowledge the production mm. of knowledge. I mean, whose theories are we learning? Whose methodologies? Whose histories? I, I mean, was about I, to ask you that because yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you because no. you said, so this comes from a decolonial uh, tradition. What mm -hmm. is that? Where our audience can find that? Uh, who's talking about these things? And we've mentioned here the relevance of also listening to indigenous people's knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there are several traditions, and uh, I think all of them are very valid. Even ourselves are coming from the global south, all of us from different uh, spaces. And we've yeah. been taught in different, uh, with different knowledges terms, concepts, and then we come to speak in English and there is a mainstream theory that we need to learn just to learn the jargon and communicate to each other. But really my understanding of gender inequalities, I needed to adjust to speak in this type of code that we speak in English, but my understanding mentally is coming from my Latin American background. I don't know if that happens to you, Tete and Rina. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I mean, like this. That's also happened to me. I think that uh, exactly, and then I, I and I and I think that uh, this is something that, like, for instance, for instance, like language is also a colonial tool, right? And then yeah. it is really apparent, you know, like, and then and then and then all, always that we here in the activist feminists in the global south need to always look ways to actually understanding and then able to articulate in English, which is like not uh, actually a very uh, easy, you know, for, for yeah. us, right? And then also like, like for me, I'm also mentally, I'm speaking in, and then thinking still in Bahasa, you know, in my head, <laughs> you know? So yeah, and then, and then I think that in a way that we also need to claim that, yeah. Absolutely. And that is that also happening. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Rina. Finish up. No, no, no. I'm asking you that then. Ah, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think for us, um, one very clear manifestation of colonialism is through culture. No, mm -hmm. the Philippines has been a Spanish colony for three hundred years, and of course, with Spanish colonization comes, you know. Uh, us being 90% Catholic, the entire population is 90% Catholic. And, you know, 
from from the choice of our names it's been uh, we've been named after saints you know my name is maria yeah. teresa so i'm the ah. supposed to be very virtuous uh, <laughs> so throughout our uh, education which is very colonial we've been taught through religion that you know it's okay if you experience suffering in your uh, temporal life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, remi I'm reminded of my Catholic uh, education. <laughs> it's okay for you to suffer on this earth <laughs> because you will inherit heaven in the afterlife. You know, blessed yeah. are the meek, blessed mm -hmm. are the poor. So all of those values that instill upon everybody, you know, uh, the culture of submissiveness, the culture of acceptance, uh, accepting and never complaining about why things are as they are. These are all yeah. very much, you know, uh, colonial constructs. Yeah, blessed are the poor, but they want to be millionaires and they support the millionaires. So, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Dumika. You were telling us these very interesting things. Uh, so you were saying the second one was precisely. No, but just to come back knowledge. to what you were saying, absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Latin American theorists. Um, and if, um, if folks are interested in learning about some of the, some of the theory around it, um, there's this guy. Uh, his name is Anibal Quijano. Mm. And uh, there's another guy. His name is Walter D. Mignolo. And um, they are, I can put it in the chat and you can share the names. Um, yeah, they are both from um, Colombia, from Argentina, and it really is in South America, it's in the Americas, that there is a turning away from this idea of post-coloniality and saying there's nothing post about it, kids. Right? There's nothing exactly. post about it. Um, and let's indeed talk about decoloniality oh, and what does a decolonial turn look like and examining the structures and systems today that are not just about policy, because let's remember policy is the epidermis. It's just the, the skin layer of a deeper colonial body. And I think where what really got me is in all my years of working at the UN and UN advocacy on the SDG negotiations on Rio plus 20 on the second committee financing for development and especially that that conference uh, on the economic crisis. You know what I thought the UN was this what I thought the UN is that in playing the geopolitical game the g77 developing countries were essentially locked in the categories the definitions the knowledge what system, are the g77 gumika explain to our the audience G77. what is the g77 yeah 133 <laughs> need... or 134 134 developing countries and that have no other choice but to come together as a massive mm. negotiation block to counter their former colonial powers oh, yeah. who yes. are called juice cans. It's kind of like a weird Capri Sun juice box, juice cans, uh, or cans <laughs> of cans of poisonous juice, I don't know. So um, juice cans is Japan, US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Australia, Israel, and I believe Korea was recently added to it. So it's this amalgamation of the light-skinned people of, of the world, either Anglo-Saxon and some sprinkle of East Asian, but essentially the ones without melanin. Okay, so that just counts is the rich with rich in money, poor in melatonin, and then the G77 are the developing countries. Melanin is, is Netherlands is there? Yeah. How about Netherlands? So yeah, not melatonin. It's what melanin. Melanin. <laughs> Rich in in money and poor in melanin. Exactly. We are poor in money and rich in melanin. melanin. Yeah. You can't yeah. have it on the wall. According to the Rolling Stones, you can't always get <laughs> what look at the skin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you were saying, Gumika, that the developing countries are locked and uh, trapped in a in a dilemma in the UN yeah, because in of the what? UN. what? Yes, and 
Well, because of the fact that the ways in which the 500 years, maybe plus years of colonial history has constructed the world today with its flows of capital, with its association of production, the self-worth, with its, you know, even its deeper ideas of who is a human being, you know, what yeah. human being is worthy. So the ways in which, uh, you know, sort of the second idea of uh, decolonialism is to, to question and to dismantle colonial knowledge productions and to really focus and center and nourish our global south knowledge productions and to understand and recognize that our global south knowledge productions don't come in the form of textbooks they don't necessarily come in the form of you know the new yorker and the new york times and um you know big broadway shows i mean knowledge is you know also culture right that's it it's it's all cultural too and that it comes in the form of oral folk Tale that comes in the form of, um, you know, uh, street theater in small villages in India, especially. A lot mm -hmm. of knowledge is is passed through in uh, the nataks, the village level street plays. Uh, you know, in 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 the Wayankulit shows. You know, in all kinds of different modes of cultural and knowledge production from the global south need to be revived and understood and respected as knowledge. Knowledge. And the third area would be no wait wait relation. wait don't go to the third don't go to the third <laughs> because I just remember there are two elements on this and the same way in one other episode Tete was saying how difficult it was for her to name herself as feminist because of mm. the stigma attached to it and mm -hmm. I think also there is a stigma attached to saying I'm promoting a decolonial thinking just because you still use the word colony. And many people say, oh, that's old, that's ideology, that's really well in the past. And some, I've heard people, uh, a Portuguese guy told me once, you know, that's the pretext you say, you know, that's really something that you, you stick around and you hang about so that you don't, under, you're, you don't take ownership of the failures of your countries. And, uh, and he was saying that it's an old story, that colonization thing, and you have, we are in the modern world and now things are happening differently. You have new, new, new governments that are corrupt. And so you take ownership of your own problems and stop laying blame on us because now we're good. Now we, we're Europeans, uh, you know, we, we are cool. So, and you are ideologized. So what the three of you say to that oh argument? Because God. it's really, I think, I think our audience are faced to that as well. I don't want to sound old. I want to sound mm -hmm. cool. And I'm, is that old? And maybe these are just reading old books from the 80s and 70s. So what do you say to oh, that? Oh, not true. Because, well, you know, the, colon, the, the idea of colonizers, you know, for us are Spaniards with the swords and the crosses. And the while beard. they may be gone already because mm -hmm. those were from centuries ago, you know, there are new forms of colonization, new, may, may, uh, new means and new approaches by which, you know, um, the Philippines, we still consider ourselves a semi-colony until now because even though we are a democracy and i say that in quotes we have yeah. our freedom and constitution but in reality it's not the filipinos who are running the show we are still held in grips you know we are uh, um controlled still by foreigners this time, you know, in the form of corporations, uh, technical advisors, uh, bankers, who all have the final say as to what gets produced, what gets taught mm -hmm. in our school, uh, mm -hmm. what we consume and what we prefer, you know, what we prefer to buy. So there are different and new forms by which colonization is alive and well in the 21st century. That's my take on it, huh? and that Portuguese guy. Bah. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. So, but Teta, let me say that you are very flowy while you're talking. You know, like this very fashionable look that you have while you talk. Wind blown effect because of the electric yeah. fan in my room. <laughs> <laughs> You're fighting colonialism while being glamorous. With the wind blowing. Yes. 
That's hilarious. <laughs> what do you that think, Gumika, so about this this thing about uh, we colony hear that being all, all the time? We hear that all the yeah. time, right? We hear that all the time. Like it was a thing of the past. Today yes. it's about corporate power. Today it's, you know, especially, I mean, um, for those of you who are familiar with Third World Network, sometimes we really, uh, because we're, we are working in the spaces of intergovernmental negotiations, from trade agreements to WTO, climate change, and the UN, the nature of these intergovernmental negotiations are north-south. So oftentimes it's seen as though we're locked into a north-south sort of uh, taxonomy or view, world view. But we are talking about these intergovernmental negotiations where that is the structure. We understand, though, that colonialism could have never happened without the vested economic, military, and political um, in, in, uh, confluence uh, the, uh, and assistance and, and alliance with indigenous populations. I mean, every example of colonialism, I mean, even recently I was reading that the Maya were in the Maya in, 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 in what is today known as Mexico. Yucatan, were, yeah. In, in the Yucatan, yeah, were eventually only really, they, the, 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 the Spaniards tried, and this is a long time ago, the Spaniards tried repeatedly to conquer them. Yeah, and essentially Maya. the only the way that the the Spaniards were really able to defeat the Maya is when they made strategic, secret alliances with different factions of Maya yeah. tribes, and were really able to pit Maya tribes against each other. Same story in India with caste yeah. and using the internal divisions of caste and strengthening them. One of yeah. the key techniques of colonialism is to really locate the division points, to locate the internal cleavages of a society and to strengthen them, to weaponize them. And guess what? Yeah. This trend has not stopped. Stopped. This trend has not stopped to take the internal rifts and weaknesses and to intensify them. And in that way, oh, yes, exactly, Tetet. Divide and conquer has not stopped. Civilizing the other has not stopped. Educating the native has not stopped. The disciplining of the subjects today, nation states and their subjects, has not ended. So all of these colonial techniques, tactics, programs, rationalities, political agendas, they have only become more and more sophisticated by private capital embracing both the politically powerful in the South and the politically yeah. powerful in the North. And so yeah. we have today a power mapping of the world, not just a north-south. When we say north-south, it's almost a proxy for the structures of power, right? And the ways in which the vested elite interests of the south are very much entwined with the vested elite interests, economic, political, military of the north. And we see this everywhere. I you know, uh, grew up in Indonesia, as uh, most of you know, and uh, growing up in Indonesia during the Suharto uh, regime, during the Suharto dictatorship, one of the things uh, that we heard about often was the Berkeley Mafia. Uh, what is the Berkeley Mafia? It is uh, a lot of the economic elite in the government and in industry in Indonesia who all went to UC Berkeley, University of California. Ah, Berkeley. yeah the yeah. institution and were trained in the same kind of neoclassical economics. And these yeah. were the very people who then worked side by side with the IMF and the World Bank yeah. in the yeah. neocolonial project of turning Indonesia yeah. into a satellite state to service yeah. the big oil corporations and today the palm oil corporations. And so the ways in which yeah. our colonial states have been turned into economic satellites has to be considered. So it's become more sophisticated. I would say to yeah. your Portuguese friend, hey, it's not a thing of the past. We have different names and structures for it today, <laughs> but it's the same yeah. thing again. <laughs> I was Just gonna say, to that, <laughs> I was going to say this, that in Mexico, we have the Chicago boys, which is the same Chicago as the boys, yeah. boys. And exactly. let me ask a question. And so maybe also Rina can answer with yeah. what she's about to say. Because I've also heard the, to say that 
it's also not true to talk about north and south because there is a south in the north yes. and the south is very rich now so what what is that and we still keep on talking about north and south so people say let's dismantle that talk about north and south there is a more complex reality and to me it's like i see all of the flows from the south to the north and i don't want to dismantle the terms but there are people who say stop talking about that. that's old that's a thing of the past so rina what do you say to that I mean, like, I, I, I'm, I think that, you know, I, I'm actually want to respond first. I was like trying to say something yeah. when we were <laughs> talking something about Indonesia and then the yeah. Berkeley boys and all that, because it's very ironic, you know, like uh, knowing Indonesia history, right? Mm -hmm. Like, 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 for instance, when uh, the, 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 the Indonesia, like the, uh, uh, you know, like try to actually have an independence coming from mm -hmm. also uh, from the Netherlands, right? And then from the Dutch. And then we actually uh, nationalize, you know, all the private companies like have, that also have in Indonesia. We, we actually try to eliminate, you know, like the education of the Dutch. And then also uh, that's why not so many people able to speak uh, Dutch after that, right? Because we try to retain our languages, try to right. do something about it and, and, and actually try to, like we call it nationalization for us in Indonesia and maybe in the Philippines is actually a good thing, you know, like because that's the term that we use to, to actually nationalize uh, the, the 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 legacy of the colonial right so that's that is why and then and then it's also like Indonesia history of the non-alignment movement right and then now with 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 the Suha, with the Suharto regime and suddenly it got flipped like that totally right and then and then and then after that more and more neo-colonialism that coming in in indonesia with all those forces of economy uh you know imperialism and etc so for me i think that it's still apparent you don't talk about there's no global north and global south it's really we felt that still right and it is not ge geographic it's not like you going from here to there is the is the legacy of that rooted uh kind of discrimination and then also all of those exploitation that coming from the north to the south so no yeah it's still there and then we talk about it a lot in and in, in last time yeah yeah now the few and now the future. I want to hear the future. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Bumika. Yeah, All right. So I'm going to be asking Emilia because she keeps on uh, asking us all of these questions. So now I turn <laughs> to you. She's like, <laughs> yes. Why what? is decolonialism a feminist aspiration? Absolutely. Like, why do uh, feminists call for decolonialization? That is at the center, but really, really quick. I just want to uh, pay respect Finish to what argument. Rina said, because Rina just um, really hit the nail on the head, I got to say. Um, and what, 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 you know, it's really such a central point. And um, maybe some of you have heard this book, um, and I've been looking at it recently. It's called The Jakarta Method. And uh, the, the book called The Jakarta Method outlines, you know, exactly the coherent program the CIA carried out in Indonesia in 1966 with the coup d'etat that took down the Sukarno, the non-aligned movement, 1955 Bandung Sukarno uh, uh, sovereignty, and really put in place General Suharto, who is an army general, and the way in which the Jakarta method was carried out became actually a coherent project of the CIA, which they then copy paste applied to a country called Chile, where they put in place someone called Pinochet. And yeah. then they carried it out. The next place they carried it out was in <laughs> Egypt, you know, where they put in place, you know. So, I mean, it was a coherent method and it was termed within the CIA, within the military industrial complex and the intelligence community, it was termed the Jakarta method. So, um, 
it gave me such a it, it, just to just to understand this really really fleshes out how imperialism in the modern context of so-called post-independence has yeah. been just changed form and the form it has changed into is a more complex animal because it involves the people from the colony in a more strategic manner right they become heads of state they become army generals they become uh, yeah. real alliances between the vested power interests so i really would like to just uh, highlight this point that we have to look at the alliances being made and the ways in which when someone says there's a south in the north absolutely there's a south in the north and it is not about it is not about the vast groups of people it is about the uh, anatomy of power yeah so yeah. Uh, we ought to keep that in mind and we got to keep that yeah, there is a coherence to it these what we see today in neoliberal and now financial globalization is not just a phenomenon it was very deliberately constructed the role of the state was very strategically turned from that of a developmental state in the bandung era to then that of a, a facilitating the private sector state and today it's been uh, very much distorted into a de-risking state where the state is mandated now to de-risk private sector investments and financial leveraging, as you all know so well from the blended finance uh, phenomenon that has swept the multilateral and IFI world. I don't think our audience knows about blended finance or IFI, so I think uh, <laughs> the more you go into those issues, Bumika, you get into trouble of having to explain everything you're mentioning. <laughs> Let's just say in one sentence, blended finance is, you know, tricky little ways of um, getting the big banks into uh, what they call development finance. So where before it was about, okay, the former colonial powers have to give assistance to the formerly colonized world, the historically plundered world. Then now today they're like, oh, you know, we're just little old states. We don't have the money. We have to get money from the private sector and from big banks yeah. and from big index funds. Look, they're just swimming in trillions of dollars of this financial investment money. So we have to use all that all that portfolio capital, we got to use all that financial investment money. And uh, so what do they need? You know, what, how can we make them invest? Let's be at their service, you know, let's be their butlers and see if they need an extra towel or a new cocktail <laughs> refill or- uh, They need to know, incentivize. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's becoming butlers of private capital, you know? Do you need a massage, you know? Do you <laughs> You need my soul, uh, anything for you. <laughs> okay, Mika. So you were going to finish your third point about colonialism, and then and you have the feminism. question on feminism and, and uh, decolonialism. Absolutely. Um, the feminist decolonialism is, um, uh, uh, there had so I'm going to put some of these names just in case people are interested. There um, is a particular theorist. Her name is Maria Floro, and she's uh, Argentinian. And there's many, many, many other all through the global south. Those who are talking about a decolonial feminism, and a decolonial feminism essentially is the kind of principle or the perspective. That you know, we can't talk about feminism without talking about the decolonial structures. Um, uh, I'm frozen, everything's frozen, yes, yeah. yes, you're frozen, but we can hear you. Ah, so yeah, it's just, um, it's just simply the idea that, um, that 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 at the core of feminist resistance, at the center of feminist revolution. Feminism is also about the structural inequalities. Feminism is also about the colonial production of knowledge. And we have a feminist production of knowledge. We have a, a, a feminist futures vision of what does a world that dismantles social hierarchies look like? What does a world that reclaims, uh, reclaims healing 
and 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 pleasurable and soulful relationships with each other with ourselves and with mother nature look like so a feminist conceptualization is really taking a lot of these main ideas about repairing relations uh transforming and changing policies you know um really producing our own knowledge and doing it through a very explicitly feminist lens that puts at the center the sexual division of labor and puts at the center that the entire global economy is resting on the subsidizing shoulders of women's labor, that we yeah. women are the greatest historical subsidy to what is called the economy that there would be no economy, there would be no wage economy without our unpaid, unremunerated, invisibilized work. So that that iceberg thing, you know, where the, the vast majority of the iceberg in the water is women's um, yes. unseen labor. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Ted and Andrina, do you want to... Do you want to advance on some futuristic uh, predictions or dreams so that Bumika also had theirs, hers? <laughs> oh, Rina, we can hear you. No, you're muted. Yes. I know. <laughs> I'm muted. Yeah, so I was like looking at that, 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 that looking at me. <laughs> I think like, <laughs> like 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 for me like the 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 issue of you know like if we're talking about the colonial future yeah and then talking about feminist decolonial future for for me I really felt that it it needs to actually have the notion of justice you know like 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 that that is actually my my point right like so it needs to have a notion of justice so justice meaning that there we need to acknowledge there is injustices that happen because like all those colonial legacy we need to also know who's perpetrator of that injustices right who are the actors who are our enemies right and then also who are actually causing those injustice and then also we need to understand like who got most affected and then when you're talking about justice you're talking about remedy right so for me the principle is that so it's sometimes like the way that we see it for for instance like what kind of development we want is actually development that based on justice that look into how we redistribute you know wealth power uh, and resources, we call it redistributive justice, right? And also economic justice, social and gender justice, environmental justice, and also accountability to the people. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like if if you ask my vision about what kind of feminist uh, decolonial future, like for me, uh, I think that I will pick one thing, which is like. The, the important part for me is redistribution of wealth, power, resources. That redistributive justice is very, very important, right? And then, mm -hmm. and then without that, it, it's very hard to actually get the other part of the economic, social, and gender justice, you know, environmental justice and accountability. So, yeah. So that, yeah, I, I, I'm going to stop now. Making <laughs> nothing more than Maybe. that. Leave time for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave it to Tetan. <laughs> Over to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, the decolonial future is about reorganization. You know, it's a profound reorganization of economies, societies, uh, politics with care at the center. So if for Rina, the crucial element is justice, for me, I think it's about care, you know, because when you care, um, you're not going to extract, you know, uh, uh, natural resources just to serve the pleasure of uh, profits. When you care, you will value everyone's contribution. And that speaks so much about, um, you know, um, revaluing the contribution of women, your your favorite pie, Emilia. When you mentioned that the economy is actually subsidized by women's unpaid care and domestic work, so I think those are the crucial elements that would 
come into play when you talk about a decolonial future. No? So it's really about changing, you know, changing, redistributing, and also valuing those that are not being given value in a market economy. Mm. What about you, Rumika? <laughs> Bringing your crystal ball to say and read what the future, the colonial future looks like. I mean, everything everyone is saying, absolutely on point, absolutely on point. It is about care. It is about uh, really recalibrating from production to reproduction. It is about, uh, it, I have to say, it's also about reviving um, the ideas of uh, connection and pleasure because neoliberalism very much, you know, it, it eradicates and it 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 it, it, it makes the, the the pleasure of living so difficult in so many ways. In so many ways, the kinds of epidemics of loneliness, isolation, and um, the the ways in which we are so hard on ourselves as women, especially. <laughs> I mean, that is the most enduring legacy of patriarchy is the relentless inner critic that we have in our heads. I mean, men don't even have something called imposter syndrome. You know, men don't have like body issues the same way. Women's entire lives are defined by these body issues. And so really reviving pleasure and connection and just absolute shameless, you know, uh, so-called shameless. Um, enjoyment and reclaiming of our sovereign bodies, right? And that said, that does not mean that we let the structural slide. It also means that we are looking at intellectual property rights with a feminist vision. It means we're looking at tax justice with a feminist vision. It looks. It, it means that we're talking about climate finance and a feminist vision. What kind of climate finance? Where is it going? Who is it supporting? Who is in the decision-making process of all financing flows? It means that we're talking about fiscal policy. This policy meaning essentially the ways in which any government spends its money, right? How much money is being spent on subsidizing corporations and on the military endeavors versus how much money is being spent on health and education? We know that the, the, the greatest supporter, the greatest anchor of uh, women and children is public sector, is public goods, public services. And even in a pandemic where the, the chronic disinvestment of public health sector is, has, has caused such devastation around the world, you still see the International Monetary Fund in its loans attach conditions that still reduce public expenditure for education and health. You know, we're working with colleagues in Ecuador, in Quito, and it is mind blowing that with everything Ecuador in particular has suffered with the public health sector, that even during during 2020 COVID, they laid off 20% of their public health workers. So we revive wow. the centrality of the public to displace the private. The feminist vision is about having a sharp strategy on this battle ground between the public and the private, right? And to be able to navigate through those counter arguments of corruption and governance. Yes, all of that's important. Accountability is important. So if that if accountability is important, let's start with the multinational corporations. Yeah, that's right. Five percent of carbon polluters. Let's start exactly. with the governments that support them and that facilitate and 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 give them legal protections through investor state dispute settlement. So the feminist vision is about having their finger, having our amazingly strong fingers in all of these pots, in all of these pots. So you don't have to become an expert on um, public policy and international economy and financial institutions. But you do have to look at how these not so sexy um, sort of uh, systems and practices are a feminist issue, how they are shaping your life from the inside out. And if not your life directly, you know, your, your mama's life, your auntie's life, your, your, your sister's life, mm. the, the lives around you. 
And so I think our job as feminist visionaries, our job as feminist activists and, and feminist, you know, creators is to come together yeah. in, in making these links clear in really drawing out these links in the most accessible and urgent way. Um, and I know I have some work to do on this because sometimes the language I use is the colonial language. Even when I say dismantle colonial productions and knowledge, I'm like, oh, that means dismantling a lot of the words in my head. <laughs> you know, mm. <laughs> you know I have to, I, a lot of it, the reason why I feel like it's so powerful, it's been a very spiritual process for me because I have to look at myself. I have to look at how I am the educated native and I am a colonial production in so many ways. All of us who walk into the UN, you know, That's you know, not to say that we're all complicit, but we're all part of this gray matter, you know, there's yeah. no escaping it. So it's been, I think it's a beautiful spiritual process to look at the coloniality within ourselves. I remember yeah. Rina, you were That's saying- true. That's true, that's true. Rina, you were wearing your UN dress yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> the only time I'm <laughs> the blue string has come off and I can barely see my photo anymore. It's been so long. I think the last time I was in the UN was 2018. <laughs> well, my UN outfit is still a tutu, so I'm still happy with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, people, for you, we have a gift for you today. We have our art, art segment. So let's go and watch that and then we go back. Yeah. And military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. We are joined in this operation by our staunch friend, Great Britain. Other close friends, including Canada, Australia, Germany, and France, have pledged forces as the operation unfolds. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Is Bumika there? Bumika! She walked yeah. out. She, she no, got scared. Do your own moves. <laughs> yeah. Bumika, do your own moves. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was George Senior. It was. It's George. Was George, George some was speech. We announced the war on terror on Afghanistan. I so I as the only thing that comes to mind is like this. <laughs> <laughs> and mind you, it's already the no, anniversary. Yeah of 9-11 that's why we also thought that it would be good to you know to put our artivism in context especially now you know that 9-11 is uh, around the corner 20 years you know what we're just 20 year imperial project i mean it's 20 years yeah white dude sitting in the pentagon being you know how do we become world empire um you know we got to assert our, our military power. We got to control the resource flows of oil and minerals and gases in the Middle East. Yeah. I mean, but it's, it's, it's the oldest thing in the book, right? <laughs> There's also light at the end of the tunnel. It's also the 10th year anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Let you know that. Yeah. <laughs> So I think a lot of the yeah, active groups in the US, they're already uh, hyped up, no? Those are two big events coming up this month. Oh, you have to tell me about them. I'm so out of the loop. <laughs> See, I'm so colonial. I know what's happening in the US. <laughs> just okay. out of the loop. Yeah, no, I mean, um, uh, again, with Occupy Wall Street, uh, I, I don't think there was enough of a feminist vision or Global South vision. It was about it was about resources and, and and income and wealth inequalities in the United States that takes into account definitely the racial wealth gap 
and that mm -hmm. really was focused on Wall Street and the Wall Street yep. sort of paradigm. But I don't think there was but, a Global South analysis or a feminist analysis or a colonial analysis or a historical lens to it. I still it think it's good. The local I still think it's good to see, to follow all of the social movements in the global north and hopefully they unfold into something yeah. that is more sophisticated and stronger and that they are outside of their, you know, their little bubble because they are at the core of everything that is impacting the planet and people, whether it be vaccines or the climate change or access to public services or whatever it is. So really people in the global north need to wake up and uh, not only focus about their own inequalities inside their territories, but really it's what are the impacts. If they are living those inequalities, can you imagine what is the damage they have done to the outside world as you were mentioning, Indonesia, Panama, Chile, and we have a long list in African countries, et cetera. So it's really, they, the citizens are, are impugned in the way that they want to be sheltered and uh, protected from listening to the truth. But once hopefully they know what their governments and regimes are doing, they need to also stand in line to try to, find a different way to engage and to relate to each other in this globalized world. There is no other way out anyway. The, the planet is on fire at this moment. Yeah. Totally agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we don't depend Absolutely. the people in the and global that, north, but it would be good to have sure, them. The Green New Deal, not the Green New Imperialism. We need Dan to technology. To, Boomik yeah. is breaking, breaking up. Yeah, and that's where the 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 the, the, the I can't hear you, but let me say that whenever we're going to be discussing this idea of the global green new deal, we're gonna bring back Boomika again. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, because we have so many questions again, you know, like the Green New oh, Deal is becoming a buzzword. But what's is there a danger to uh, the Green New Deal? What are the risks? No, because it seems like it's being packaged as the alternative already to uh, many of the injustices and the yeah. ills in our midst, no? Yeah. I have my I own know. reservations. <laughs> You know, we we didn't ha engage with the audience today. I mean, there are some comments that are great uh, in the chat. Hopefully, we we hear from you again in the next um, episode. But we would really love to hear your thoughts about what topics do you want us to address, and also what are your views. And if anybody wants to be invited to be with us, let us know. And uh, there is always room to be talking to to people who's interested in this global activism. Uh, so yeah, so sad Bumika fell down because she has been an amazing guest, enlightening us and inspiring us. Thank you, the Spice Girl Bumika. Yes. yes. And then we will bring you back. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, so we, we, can we? We don't know yet which one, uh, what is the topic for next time? Have we already decided? I mean, I think we're going to talk about the race to the bottom and the issue of tax and how it's one of the points on, on the global inequalities. And that is one of the, our proofs of global North and South being current nowadays. So that will be our next topic. So we'll be talking about austerity measures again. Illicit financial flows. Maybe we can bring in some austerity to the conversation that if you feel like. <laughs> it means like we just do this justice, yeah, when we're talking about the session and all that. Yeah. Bumika, you Bumika. Care? Thank you so much for joining us and we'll bring you back. Hey, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely.
big data <laughs> happened to you. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. say something to the audience before we say goodbye? <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, well, I'm so glad we have the session on decolonial futures. I mean, absolutely. And I, I think there's a decolonial future possible when we use our uh, imagination, when we are, when we use our, the power, our dream work and our imagination work. And I think that all the, all the ways in which we have, you know, historically done this work from, from doing art murals, to writing, to having conversations, to mapping out, you know, the kinds of changes we want to see of our history and of our present define the future. To not, not be limited by what we know and what we've lived. Like, I think the most challenging, most, most brave work in my life has been to be able to look at the future in a way I have never lived uh, in, 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 in through, through, through feelings I've never experienced through, you know, possibilities I've ne never actually physically seen with my eyes. Um, and I think that takes, much more work than policy analysis and writing papers and so much more work in terms of deep spiritual work of looking at her you know looking at what is possible looking at what kind of what we mm. want to create um i think i can just speak for myself in my life i've spent too much time fighting and resisting and not enough time dreaming and creating and there's a kind of poverty of the of the mind in that. There's a kind of limitation that we impose on ourselves when we are resisting and reacting and fighting all the time. Because there's it's endless. The battles are endless. And the minute we do one, there's another one. It's endless whack-a-mole. It's endless whack-a-mole. They are this is a system that is beyond us. It, being involved in every process is not about mm. tracking every report that comes out. It's not about that. It's about understanding what are the systems at play, you know, what is the logic at play, and how do we create and strengthen our logic, our system, our views, you know? So I think, um, and this is sort of, you know, really coming from the heart, heart of a policy nerd. Uh, we need, I think, to spend less time on policy and more time on imagination. And to understand that policy is just a manifestation of a colonial Im imagination. So what is our decolonial imagination, right? We're living in somebody else's world. We're living in somebody else's dream. We're living in the white colonial man's dream. So what? What does our dream look like? What does that world look like? So I just want to leave everyone with that, to dream hard, to dream fiercely. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> okay, sadly, we've come to an end of another session of the Despised Girls.